So no pressure. We'll just start with like the toughest question <laughs> there is. So I have that. So um, I think before we start to address the question of um, why does God allow suffering, I think it's important to uh, to look at how society views suffering. Um, you know, typically I think we as a as a society as individuals. We're actually willing to accept suffering under a couple of different conditions. The first is if we feel like the end that we're going to get from it, something that we've chosen ourselves, we think that the end of that suffering is going to be something good. We think about exercise as a good example. You know, I'll get up early in the morning, I'll go to the gym, I'll lift heavy things, I'll put them down, I'll run on a treadmill like a hamster because I want to in the blank, look good, I want to be healthy, uh, I want to lose some weight, that kind of thing. So I think that's one example. And second, if we, if we see that some good is going to come, if, if we haven't chosen it, but we see some good will come out of it, uh, it could be, you know, um, a spouse that's, that's working a, a tough shift at work, or if they're traveling a lot for work, or if um, my husband or wife is deployed, you know, we see that there's going to be... Uh, a financial benefit to that, or we see that, you know, our country is going to be protected. Uh, we, we accept the end of, of what that suffering is, even if we haven't chosen, chosen it. Um, so I think that that's, that's important to kind of look at before we really jump into uh, a more theological approach, is to kind of consider that there are conditions under which we will accept suffering, where we, we think that it's not uh, so bad a thing after all because of the end result. I think we struggle to accept suffering when we can't see the point of it. When we, when we view the end result of it as pointless or we don't see uh, what good can come out of it. So I think that's, that's the challenge of suffering uh, when, we, when we struggle to accept it. That's when we don't choose it or we don't see what good can come out of it. Before we get into, again, before we get into um, suffering and uh, why does God allow it, what is the Christian view of suffering? And before we can really even answer that question, I think wrapped up in it is the question of why did Jesus have to suffer? The most straightforward answer to that question, I think, is found in the, the very famous line from Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, where Jesus says, For God so loved the world... That he gave his only begotten son. So that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Uh, you don't see it much uh, at football games anymore. But for a while there it was like you know Tim Tebow would have it on his eye black. And you'd see John 3.16 all over the place. Um, but that's really the, the thumbnail answer to why did Jesus have to suffer. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. So that we might not die but have eternal life. What does that mean? Well, through the sin of Adam and Eve, the relationship of mankind with God was broken. And this great chasm, this great divide was opened up between God and man. Finite man, limited man, had broken covenant, broken faith, broken relationship with an infinite God. So a finite person cannot pay an infinite debt. Only God can do that. And that's the situation that's described in Matthew 18. If you remember the, the parable of the unforgiving servant, it's very interesting. Um, and I taught high school scriptures for many years. Um, I know just enough uh, biblical Greek to be dangerous, I say. Um, but I think there's something that's very, uh, very important in that passage. If you remember the parable of the unforgiving servant, Jesus is talking about this servant who owed his master a huge amount. The literal translation of a huge amount is 10,000 talents, which of course doesn't really clear it up for us. <laughs> but a talent was a coin made of gold or silver that was worth about 16 years wages. One coin worth 16 years wages. This servant owed 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. That's 160,000 years wages. So a huge amount doesn't really begin to cover 
how huge that amount is. And that's the point, right? It's kind of, uh, the parable is really about how we stood with God, right? We owed this unpayable debt, and that's why God becomes man. Man owed a debt to God, a debt with which in justice he had to pay, but the debt man owed couldn't be paid by man. Only God made man could pay that infinite debt. Someone once said, Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. So our debt was paid through the love of Jesus Christ, the innocent man who dies for the guilty, the God who conquers sin and death in the resurrection. And so thinking about suffering, we're getting a little close to understanding meaning in suffering from a Christian point of view. The death of God made man, Jesus Christ, is the most calamitous evil that could ever happen. Nothing even comes close by comparison. Creatures killed their creator. But the greatest good imaginable, a miraculous good, comes from it. The salvation of all humanity for all time. Good comes out of that greatest of evils. The suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ does many things. It not only pays our debt, but it also reconciles us with God, heals the wounds of our sin, it restores us to right relationship with the Lord, and enables us in baptism to be his adopted sons and daughters, as well as heirs to eternal life. So in summary, we can say that kind of the shorthand answer to the question of suffering is that God never desires suffering. Evil is, 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 is evil. Suffering, is, suffering isn't evil. It, it's not good in and of itself. But God can bring good out of evil. He allows suffering to bring about a greater good. And the penultimate example is the cross. The greatest of evils brings about the greatest of goods. Remember, as a society... We have a problem when pain, with pain and suffering when we don't choose it for ourselves, or when we can't see its meaning or purpose. So when someone comes to you and says, um, well, what about my grandfather's Alzheimer's? Or my grandmother's cancer? What good can come from a, a couple that's struggling with infertility? The husband who, despite his best efforts, can't find a job. Or the mother who's dealing with the death of a child. Here's the thing. The suffering of the God-man, Jesus Christ, has transformed and redeemed suffering. His suffering doesn't make suffering go away. He never said that we wouldn't suffer. On the contrary, he said that you will have trouble in the world but to take courage, for he has overcome the world. His suffering gives our suffering value. This is what we call redemptive suffering. The God-man, Jesus Christ, who more than anyone knows suffering, promised to be with us in our suffering, and to give that suffering value Perhaps the most articulate explanation of the church's position on this topic is an encyclical, uh, excuse me, an apostolic letter by John Paul II, Pope St. John Paul II, called On Human Suffering. Now, John Paul II knew suffering. He wrote this letter from a place of deep faith, but also deep wounds, deep knowledge of suffering and loss. He lost his mother as a child. His father died when he was a young adult, as the Nazis were taking over his country. And then he was left without an immediate family. Following the end of the Second World War, he, uh, Poland exchanged one oppressive regime for another. The Soviets rolled in. And it was under those conditions that he entered a clandestine seminary, was formed to be a priest under German occupation, was ordained, and then began to practice his ministry as a priest and later a bishop under Soviet occupation. And he wrote this particular letter on suffering just a few short years after narrowly surviving an assassination attempt and a very complicated recovery. So it seems very clear that he 
wrote this, um, this letter out of this place of deep personal knowledge of suffering. In a certain sense, I'd say that the letter is kind of a commentary on Colossians 1.24, where St. Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body and church. Now if you're paying attention, you probably were a little... Um, you kind of maybe twitched a little bit when I said what was lacking in the suffering of Christ. And Christians do in, you know, instinctively kind of recoil at that, what's lacking in the suffering of Christ? What could possibly be deficient in the suffering of Christ for our salvation? And of course, there's nothing, practically speaking, lacking in the suffering of Christ. Jesus' suffering, death, resurrection, conquers sin and death and the regime of Satan and brings redemption and salvation to all mankind for all time. So that's, that's not the problem. What John Paul says is this, human suffering has reached its culmination in the person of Christ. And at the same time, it has entered into a completely new dimension and a new order. It's been linked to love, to that love of Christ, which, which Christ spoke to Nicodemus, to that love which creates good, Drawing it out by means of suffering. He continues, in bringing about the redemption through suffering, Christ has also raised human suffering to the level of redemption. Again, he's redeemed suffering. He's given it meaning. Thus, each man in his suffering can also become a sharer in the redemptive suffering of Christ. For this reason... To the Christian, no suffering is meaningless. And again, I think that's the critical point when we're communicating this to others, is to try and find the meaning, the purpose in suffering. In Christ, our suffering can have meaning, value. And this critical point, I think, it's in um, paragraph 24, the Holy Father really breaks this open. It's a little bit of a lengthy quote, so stay with me. But he says... Does this mean that the redemption achieved by Christ is not complete? Again, what's lacking in the suffering of Christ? The answer is, of course, no. It only means that the redemption, accomplished through satisfactory love, remains always open to all the love expressed in human suffering. In this dimension, the dimension of love, the redemption, which has already been completely accomplished, is, in a certain sense, constantly being accomplished. Christ achieved the redemption completely and to the very limits, but at the same time, he did not bring it to a close. And this redemptive suffering, through which the redemption of the world was accomplished, Christ opened himself from the very beginning to every human suffering and constantly does so. So that's a lot. But what John Paul is saying is that Jesus' suffering was complete and is complete but he, in a kind of a certain sense, you could say he left the door open to that suffering so that we might, with our suffering, enter into it, even participate in it. That our suffering might have meaning by being connected to the suffering of Christ for the salvation of the world. So our suffering, offered with love, in union with the suffering of Christ, has infinite value. Through our suffering with love and union with the love of Christ on the cross, that we embody the words of Christ in the Gospel of Luke. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's through our suffering with love and union with Christ on the cross that we act as a Simon of Cyrene, helping our blessed Lord to carry his cross for our salvation. And so travel that hard road through the narrow gate, which leads to eternal life. I'd like to, to wrap up this section before we uh, kind of come back and we're going to kind of model uh, what David spoke about earlier, the, the well method, kind of using the, the, uh, the subject of suffering as, as a topic. Before we do that, I just want to conclude with a, a short meditation. If you're familiar with, there's a devotional called In Conversation with God by Francis Fernandez. It was actually earlier this week. 
Um, I just want to conclude with this. I think it's very applicable. He writes, The experience of pain always leaves one a different person than before. Pain can purify and elevate the soul. It can move us to intensify our union with the divine will. It can inspire us to become detached from worldly goods and from excessive concern for our health. Pain can make us co-redeemers with Christ. Pain can do all of this, or it can lead us away from the Lord, leaving the soul alienated from the supernatural life. When Simon of Cyrene was picked out of the crowd to help Jesus carry his cross, he did what he was told to do without enthusiasm. He was forced, writes the evangelist. The first thing he saw was the cross, just heavy wooden planks. Later on, his thoughts turned from the wood to the condemned prisoner, that very unusual man. It was then that his attitude was transformed. He helped Jesus out of love. We too should look for Christ in the midst of our trials and tribulations. By doing so, we will pay less attention to the cross and more attention to our beloved. We will discover that carrying the cross has true meaning when we walk alongside the Master. His most fervent desire is to inflame our hearts with that same fire of love and sacrifice which bur burns in his own heart. No matter how little we correspond with this wish, our heart will become a furnace powerful enough to burn away the dross of our faults. We will be changed into sacrificial offerings, blessed by suffering, until we attain to a greater purity and closer union with our beloved. We will complete, as he wants us to, the passion of the Savior for the good of the church and all souls. It's at the feet of the crucified Lord that we will come to an understanding of the true nature of love that lies in sacrifice. Yet sacrifice is sweet to him who is in love. So we wanted to kind of model what we presented. Uh, we talked, uh, David talked about the well, the well method of conversation. And so we kind of wanted to put that up and, and kind of walk through what it could look like, what a possible conversation on the subject of suffering could look like using the well method. Uh, as David said, uh, both of us have taught high school for probably more than 20 years combined. Uh, we were talking about this uh, earlier as we were preparing, and we kind of acknowledged that, you know, in our experience, uh, most of our students didn't come to us and say, um, you know, why, how can a good God allow evil to occur in the world? You know, it's, it's more, as David indicated, it comes from a place of experience. Something has happened in that person's life, some suffering has occurred, and they want answers. Um, so, again, following the, the well method, meeting them where they are. Uh, they might ask, why did uh, God let X happen if he loves us? Why did my grandfather die? Why did so-and-so, why, why was he hurt in a car accident? Fill in the blank. A possible answer would be, I'm sorry that happened. Again, kind of em empathizing, meeting them where they are, and encouraging them to, to talk, or inviting them to talk. Would you like to talk more about it? Again, trying to understand the reasons for the question. And then listen means, as David said, just listen. Similar experience with, with my wife. When, when she comes to talk to me, oftentimes I'll say, and I'll kind of stop her early on, when she's telling me about the trials of, of, uh, of any given day, and I'll say, one second, is this a fix-it conversation or is this a listen conversation? <laughs> And nine times out of ten, it's a listen conversation. So listening means just that. Just close your mouth and listen. Empathize. Acknowledge the pain that they're, they're uh, dealing with. And don't try and explain it away. This would not be the time to say, oh, they're in a better place. Or, um, you know, it's all going to work out someday. 
know, this would be the, the time to just listen, not explain it away. Identifying with them, possible follow-up questions. Um, you know, in the examples that I gave, um, why did why did Jesus, you know, have to suffer and die? That might be, it might be an opportunity again, depending on what suffering is being disclosed, to kind of talk about. Uh, some of the things that we talked about here, it's not the time to engage in apologetics debate or try and win an argument. Again, it's primarily listening time, perhaps trying to connect um, their suffering uh, with the suffering of Christ. And it's specifically uh, the fact that Jesus identifies with that suffering. He became man so that he could suffer in our place, that he could uh, pay the debt our sin deserved, um, that, that kind of thing. Um, ask them if they've seen good come out of suffering. Uh, and then, I think most importantly, and David touched on this quite a bit uh, with examples from his family, sharing your own witness. Uh, talking about suffering that you've dealt with and how your faith was helpful to you. Uh, no one can argue with your witness. No one can refute it. Uh, your experience is your experience. Uh, so sharing your own experience and how God has helped you through difficult uh, moments in your life. And... Show them how God is present to them, how God is not distant, uh, but how he's, he's helping them in the midst of the cross that they're, they're carrying. Uh, and then finally, invite. I think one of the, the most effective ways to minister to someone in a, in a very challenging situation, um, not just to fill silence, um, but we believe as people of faith that prayer has power. Um, and you can certainly say, I'll pray for you, but I think a better question to ask is, can I pray with you right now? You know, offer, offer to just intercede for them and, and pray for them. It's, it's helpful not only for them, but for you, as you're dealing in a difficult situation, to ask God to inspire you uh, to know how to minister to them and, and to give them what they need. So ask if you can pray with them. Um, what may God be asking you to do when you see someone suffering? Um, and then certainly um, making sure that they're going to be safe when they leave. This is kind of the teacher in David and I. Like, you want to make sure that they're safe. Um, they're not going to harm themselves or be a harm to others. Um, but certainly make sure also, kind of connecting back to those five uh, adults that they have in their life, please God, that, that they can go to. Make sure that there's a network of support that they can draw on as well. Um, so, but um, again, as teachers, it'd be good to kind of model the method uh, a little bit as we as we kind of wrap up. Um, and I think we can kind of we probably have some time for for questions if anyone has any. Not all at once, please. Let's have some order. Or the Ignatian method or the Theresian method 
you know, if, if you get off script in your method of prayer, it's not like the prayer police are going to, like, break out of the closet and, like, clap you in irons and take you off to prison. It's like, it's okay. Like, the, the goal of prayer is conversation with God. However you get there, like, that's the that's the objective. It's kind of the same thing. Like, there, there's, there's certainly an ebb and flow in the method. Um, you, you might certainly pray with someone much earlier in the conversation. Um... But I think, you know, the principles are the, are the main thing. But yeah, I think, you know, practice still makes perfect. Thank you. Yeah. In this model, where would you see Jesus traveling from something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say probably in the, in the invitation. It's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty much towards the end. I mean, it's thinking of John 4. Um, it's, it's pretty close to the end where he does that. So I would say, um, certainly with this question that we're looking at, um, there really isn't, uh, I mean, it depends on the suffering, I suppose. Yeah, I would say too, like, think of this outside, of, and, you know, I like steps because that's how my mind works, maybe yours doesn't. Think of this less as just even as one conversation, but as a period of time, right? What do I mean by that? The first crucial piece to any conversation around faith, especially a challenge conversation, is do you have a relationship with that person? You know how you want to hear things from certain people and not from others, right? If you come out of the gate and be like, you're committing a mortal sin, you're probably objectively correct in pointing that out. But if they don't want to hear it, you, you probably did more harm than good, right? You did, a, you did a charity in naming it, right? You'll never be wrong for naming sin as sin. But what's the ultimate goal here? Is it to just say, hey, you're doing something wrong, or is it helping? Mm. And so in this case, is you might be going back and forth on this for a long time. Right. Until you get to a point where you can say this. I will share this one example. The, the strongest tool in your toolbox, other than building relationship, to Deacon's point, is your witness. Right? Let me give you an example. I was when I was in high school, Bishop Conley. I have this memory of being in the auditorium at school. To this day, I can't remember why I was there. Right? I don't remember what we were meeting with, but the whole school is there, and our assistant principal gets up, and he had just lost his wife to an illness. And he starts telling the whole student body about his, 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 what happened. And to this day, I still can't remember a darn thing of the details except this. He start, talked about his prayers to God. He said, God, will you just heal my wife? And he said, God didn't answer that prayer. And he says some more about what the journey goes, God, will you just let her not suffer? And he said, well, God didn't answer that prayer. And he said, well, God, would you just give us more time with my wife? And he said, God didn't answer that prayer. And finally he said, I just prayed to God, will you just let her go in peace? And he said, God answered that. I fast forward many years, and I'm in Jersey. The opportunity to come home for a job comes up. So we take it. About a year, eight months in, I find out my father's diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in the midst of COVID. And so we buckle up. We're going to do this journey. We're going to do it. We go to the chemo, the treatments, the whole nine yards. We do it. And I remember being in the ICU, and it's that meeting, all the doctors come in where they say there's nothing more we can do. I didn't cry at the funeral, but that's when it, it very much hit me. And I remember talking, you know, I couldn't guess, oh, we have, talking to the doctor, and I was saying, you know, his lungs are just going to eventually peter out, and he's just going to go. And I said, well, how long? And, and my wife's like, my wife's a nurse, so it's probably has about three weeks. So now we're, we're, wait, we're expecting on our third, he doesn't know yet. And we're wondering, how, how do we do this? How do we tell him? How do we tell family? He had kind of kept it private. And I remember sitting at, at the table being like, gosh, now we only have three weeks. How do we do this? And I'm going scrolling to my phone looking at pictures of him. And, and on the counter is a statue of St. Joseph. He's headless because my two-year-old got to him. <laughs> so it's Joseph holding Jesus, holding Joseph's head. <laughs> but it's still, the imagery works, right? 
And if you know anything about Joseph, he, if you've ever been to the, the Basilica in Montreal, there's all these altars of his different titles. And one says patron of happy death. And I'm hit by the assistant principal in the story. And I go, St. Joseph, just pray to God that whenever my dad goes, he just goes to peace. Three hours after I prayed that prayer, I got the phone. Not three months. Prayer is powerful. If we trust in God. In that moment, God's saying to me, you go around and you give these talks on, on me, do you trust me right now? You go around and you proclaim the faith. Do you trust me? When you, when you say that Jesus came, that you might have life and live to the full, do you trust that I'm doing that for your father even now? Do you trust that the fa your father, who I knew from the moment he was in his mom's womb, I still got him right now? And now granted, I don't know where he is. That's why we pray for the dead. I pray that he's with the Lord. We don't know. But is that sense of great trust where the Lord said, I still have him even in that suffering. And I think back to my assistant principal, who in his witness, probably had no idea if any high schooler was living, listening to him. Until about so many years later, this high schooler remembered and prayed the same prayer. Now let me ask you this. Do you remember any of the steps of the method? Do you remember the story I just told you about my father? That's the power of witness. Can you do that first before you give a great apologetic answer that Deacon Chris gave. Can you do that first before you name something to say? They can't argue with your listening. They can't argue with your witness. Once that ground, put it aside. Evangelize like your garden. Don't look at a seed in the ground and yell at it for not producing fruit. It's got to germinate. It's got to grow. It's got to sprout. Have you done the legwork before then you say, hey, here's the truth. You need to say that. But you need to do the legwork there too. So I would say to you is, no, there's nothing wrong with naming it a sin. It probably comes, like even says, identify and fight. But there might be a part where you're just spooling over here. Until you sense in your relationship, yeah, they're ready to hear. And sometimes you just got to trust the Lord and do it. But that would be my, my own personal story. I think you also had a question in the back of your head. Yeah. Oh, no, not a question. Just a statement um, you know, about prayer. We always think we have to have the perfect prayer for that moment. And all you want to do is reach out to that person that came to you, saying, I'm going through this hard situation. My, um, I just had somebody this morning at church say, would you pray for a friend of mine that was in a terrible car accident and he's in a coma. And all you say is, yes, let's just say an our father. You know, it doesn't have to be this major. It's our Father. Everyone knows that. And the Holy Spirit just comes to you, and, and that just comes each of us. Down. And then you say, I'll pray for him. And then you go on and you pray for him whenever you think about it. I think we get so tied up in having a perfect situation. And all we have to do is show our, our humility and our humbleness. Right. Yeah. And not only the, the perfect prayer, but I think sometimes someone comes to us with a with a challenging issue. We feel like we have to have some kind of answer that's going to like fix it. Um, like you said, that's predominantly a male male problem. <laughs> we want to fix everything, but probably for all of us, you know, when someone comes to us, we want to make it better. We we don't want we want to make the suffering go away, and we we just can't. Um, so so not trying to to fill silence or fix the problem but listen and be present and offer to be present in the future and like you said not not make it over complicated thank you anyone else comments questions my question is about what what are the follow up sessions I think it, I mean, it, it depends on, uh, it depends on the situation, certainly. Uh, it depends on the relationship. It depends on how the previous conversation went. But I think it would, it would, you know, pretty much follow steps two through four 
Again, sort of like what David was saying before as well, you might spend a lot of time in steps one and two before you ever, you know, get to move on. But certainly, you know, witness, uh, just like prayer, I think, could be in any of these steps, witness can and, and should be in any of these steps as well. Very early on, Jesus, you know, tells her who he is. And that's a, that's a, it's a big deal, again, given the historical context of that. And then how does that lead to the next two classes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, now that we spent a good time just about talking about kind of the art of it and kind of an initial model, the next two will deal with two other topics. So there are three main topics that came from the survey, which is really convenient because there's three sessions. <laughs> so you made our job pretty. There was other ones, but three that came back. So the first was God's stuff, which we, we thought was going to just kind of ease in to talking about art. The second one is, well, why do I have to go to church? Why do I have to get in the car? You know, can I just read my bulletin during Monsignor's homily? Can I leave after communion? You know? <laughs> so that'll be, that'll be number two. And uh, myself and Oscar Rivera, who's the director of youth ministry, will be here for that one. And the last one will be tackling the question of sexuality and gender. And how do we talk on that? I'm going to go on a limb and say all these three, as we were saying, you know, we appreciate your time we've gone over. These could each be like an ongoing kind of formation. So we're just adding a piece to your toolbox. So by no means is it the full, the full gamut. Um, but right in time for the holidays, for those holiday dinner gatherings and kind of conversations, you know. That everyone feels so comfortable. Everyone feels so life. safe and <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, we'll be finishing up in, by November. We're right in time for Thanksgiving. So, <laughs> the topics, you know, so that's what we're looking at in terms of topic sessions, and we'll be revisiting some of these. One of the things we're also going to invite is, is I know we spent a lot of time up front speaking, simply to lay a groundwork. Bring your situations. Okay? Bring, like, all right, we talk about suffering, but do you have this current situation right now that I'm dealing with? Or right now, my grandkid or kid just doesn't want to go to church. Bring that situation as well for the following time as well. So that's what we're kind of looking for in terms of the syllabus. Is that what's going to come up and you listen to? What's that? The children do not want to listen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what we struggle with. That's what we want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> we want that bridge all the way through all yeah. of our children and grandchildren. And yeah. What I love is when they, quote unquote, don't want to listen to you yet. 24 hours later, they'll stand up and repeat your conversation directly with somebody else. Yep. Oh. It's it was good. <laughs> well, I think the uh, follow uh, up, first of all, thank you, uh, David and Chris, for, for, for coming. Um, I think where we're going to go from here, that, uh, John, you can kind of. When's the next session? It is Tuesday, October 14th, I want to say. Hold on. I want to make sure. I'm sorry, 18th. 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 Tuesday the 18th. Same time, same place. Is that the second Tuesday? It's the... Uh, and we'll, uh, obviously, this goes in third the bulletin. Tuesday. Third. It goes this on is the, the fourth, uh, fourth website. And, and, and really, you can be very helpful in, in just getting the message out. You know, um, what did this evening do for you? And do you know a, a parent or a grandparent that perhaps could benefit? Because I would assume, well, possibly the first five, ten minutes, you might, you know, get the well method passes and... <laughs> we'll give you the credit for it. Uh, but um, that, you know, so if someone comes to the next session, it's not they're lost, so to speak, you know, to kind of give a quick overview. <coughs> John is also going to uh, send this. Uh, this has been taped. And, and so it will go on both, I would assume, the website. Yep. And we could even provide a link, I think, to, to parents yep. uh, in our catechetical program. So this will get out to a lot more people, but her, your help is to just, hey, did you get that link, or hey, did you, here's a chance, you really should sit down with this, because hopefully it, 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 it helped you, um, not only on the specific topic on suffering, but just that whole 
initial, how do you deal with young people? The next session, yeah, why my kid doesn't want to go to church. The, the kind of underneath of all of that is, why do I need faith? You know, that's kind of what they're kind of saying. What has this got to do with soccer and lacrosse and basket weaving and all the other things that they're a part of? So, I, I mean, I think that's what we're trying to do is, is, you know, when we're talking to our young people, how do we, we first of all, witness to them, but then show them, yeah, this, this has a lot to do with soccer. This has a lot to do with lacrosse. Uh, we really, you know, because it's part of life, and faith is a part of life. I was just going to say, is it going to include the Gen Xers going to church? Is that, I have a problem with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because we, we, we have a generation that's big ball drop, I think, you know, and uh, so what do we do with that? And that could be helpful too. So I mean, I think hopefully all of us can, and again, even by going back and watching the video, putting your stories into that, say, oh wow, I think I, I could approach this, or maybe this will, maybe not at Thanksgiving, but you know, <laughs> at another time. Well, I want to thank all of you uh, for being here, um, and, and thank once again uh, Deacon Chris and, and Dave for being here. Home. Amen.